the swindlers actually play the con on him twice because he was so invested in the story they were telling him that he went home and got more money and played the con again after he had been swindled. Today's topic is long cons. Cons that take a lot of time to pull off. To demonstrate, we'll take a trip out west to Denver, where Lou Blonger has set up the rag scam. Like most long cons, it takes a lot of people and a lot of cash up front to make it work. Longer acquired both during his 25 years in Denver. The rag is also known as the big store or the wire. Whatever you call it, the plan is almost always the same. A roper identifies a sucker, then lures them into a seemingly legitimate enterprise as an office or storefront employees working, and in all respects, it appears to be a typical business. Once inside, the roper introduces the sucker to the spieler, who tells the tale of how to cheat the business and make a lot of money. The spieler says they have someone on the inside who provides information before anyone else knows. It's like knowing what horse wins the race so you can place a bet before the bookie has to pay off. Longer ran the same con, but instead of horse racing, he enticed suckers to take advantage suckers to take advantage of the new Denver stock market. Starring as the sucker in this scam was J. Frank Norfleet. Amy Reeder wrote a book about the escapade called The Mark Inside. She gave an account of Blonger's caper, first caper for C-SPAN's book review. He was uh, placing money on um, a, a stock exchange using insider tips, so he couldn't possibly go wrong. And it was worth his while to put quite a bit of his own money behind this absolutely sure thing. Um, and the stock market was, in fact, rigged and was a set. So this all happens in the first chapter of my book. And that chapter ends with him realizing he has been taken for everything he's worth, plus a bunch more. The swindlers actually play the con on him twice because he was so invested in the story they were telling him that he went home and got him that he went home and got more money and played the con again after he had been swindled and so he was um, 54 for no I'm sorry forty five thousand dollars poorer at the end of uh, these two weeks and he was absolutely stone broke um, so the the end of the con the last of the con the last act in the play calls for the mark to go home silent and never say what has happened to him, both because his reputation could not survive such a, a mortification, but also because the mark thinks that he has been participating in something shady or underhanded and that it himself will be open to prosecution. So in this way, the swindlers buy the marked silence. This scam took place in 1919 and the $45,000 Norfleet lost equals about $700,000 in 2021. Speaking of doing something illegal. Actress Felicity Huffman and 12 other parents charged in a college admissions bribery scheme have agreed to plead guilty. In a statement, Huffman says she felt deep regret and shame. She apologized to those who have gotten into college honestly. To those who have gotten into college honestly. Adding my daughter knew absolutely nothing about my actions and in my misguided and profoundly wrong way, I have betrayed her. It's easy to think Huffman and the other bold-faced names involved in this still are the cons. They're not. The scammer here is William Singer, the man in the middle who took the cash, bribed school officials, and got the students into prestigious schools. After his arrest, Singer pleaded guilty to charges of racketeering, conspiracy, money laundering, conspiracy fraud of the United States, 
and obstruction of justice. Here's Andrew Lelling, the United States Attorney for the District of Massachusetts at a press conference. Ran a college counseling service and something called the Key Worldwide Foundation. Between roughly 2011 and 2018, wealthy parents paid Singer about $25 million in total to guarantee their children's admission to elite schools. Beyond enriching himself, Singer used that, or used that money to bribe college officials. Division I coaches, college exam administrators, all to secure admission for the children of his clients, not on their merits, but through fraud. When we started, I mentioned that this scam is sometimes called the big store. Here's one for you. The big store. Here's one for you. We built a fake luxury store in Los Angeles and filled it with Payless shoes. The guests at our grand opening party had no idea. They're elegant, sophisticated. I just think it's so classy. And I could tell it was made with high quality material. These fat and even $600 for Payless shoes. But you can get these same shoes at Payless for $19.99 or lower with our epic holiday deals. Why pay more when you can pay less? Okay, they built a big store and ran a scam. But they gave the money back. And the suckers were people who thought they were buying designer shoes. And they got some free bubbly and they got some free bubbly and food. Plus, I thought it was fun, and I get to write the script. So here we are. Moving on, we welcome Michael Cox to the microphone. Over the years, he had sold many things, including insurance, mortgages, and real estate. His girlfriend called him a nat- girlfriend called him a natural salesman and got him a job writing mortgages in her subprime lending business. It turned out, Cox was also a natural-born con artist. His colleagues taught him how to falsify documents in ways that would boost his commissions. When the company closed, he'd learned enough about the process to start his own shop. He may have been a gifted salesman, but he also knew that things would be so much easier if he didn't have to sell at all. So he began creating non-existent people with false identities and the paperwork to make them look like customers. That's when a former partner dropped a dime and the FBI took him down for wire fraud. He got a mortgage company. No problem. He would just create fake people with real social security numbers and identities that made them eligible for credit cards. Here's Cox to tell you the rest. You know, I would then order secured credit cards in their name, which creates a a credit profile. I would make the payments. And after about six months, uh, they would have seven months. uh, They would have 700 credit scores. So now these guys have 700 credit scores and I would attach them to employment I would then go out and buy properties in the Ybor City area of Tampa, Florida. I bought property, I would go in and buy properties for $40,000 and $50,000, but I would record the value or the sale of or the value or the sale of those properties at 200,000, 195, 210, two, right around 200. And that way I was able to then turn around and get an appraisal on the property. You know, you clean up the outside. It's basically a crack house. But you take 10 grand, you clean it up outside, it looks good, you get an appraiser to come in. He uses the comparable sales, which are all my sales, and says, you know, it's funny, it's a shitty neighborhood, but this house over here went for 200, this one 195, that one for 205. I mean, I think your house is worth 200,000, great. So he gives me an appraisal, I go to the bank, I submit all the paperwork to the bank, and they approve the guy for a loan for $190,000. The loan closed back 30 minutes later, give him the documents, they cut me a check. You know, I just made 100,000, $150,000 on this property. And each guy did this, and I'd say on average, each person was worth around half a million to 600,000. I'd make the payments for three or four months, and then eventually my synthetic identity, my false borrower would have a a tragic accident, would have a a tragic accident, and he would stop making his payments. So then when the collection agent started sending letters, I would have his sister write a letter saying, look, he was, he's, he's in a coma, he was in an accident, I'd send a copy of like a 12 car pile up. Now, the collection agencies, they have a reason why, why this guy, they don't think fraud. And so they immediately foreclose and they put the house back on the market and they sell. They end up losing $100,000, $150,000. You know how this story ends. You've heard it a dozen times. Cox gets caught, goes to prison, and comes out a reformed guy. 
comes out a reformed guy. While in prison, he collects stories other prisoners have told him, and upon release in 2019, the natural-born salesman gets a book deal. Then there is another group of con artists who run long cons, run by the police. Police can set up elaborate stings to catch groups of criminals or run smaller operations to catch one or two people. One of the biggest long con stings in history hit its climax in June of 2021 when police arrested more than 800 people worldwide in a huge global sting. The sting began operations in 2018. They did it by creating a phone that allegedly had highly encrypted software hidden behind a simple app like a calculator. It would allow people involved in drug transportation to speak to one another secretly. The phones were sold. The phones were sold for a thousand dollars or more each, and required a fee of around two thousand dollars a year to keep them operating. Thousands of the devices found their way into more than three hundred criminal syndicates over one hundred countries. The Wall Street Journal describes the phones. These are devices where there's a single app that promises secure encrypted communications, and they're designed to keep communications and other uh, exchanges out of the prying hands of law enforcement. More than 27 million messages and pictures were captured by law enforcement and will be used as evidence. So, so where did the FBI find the technology? The FBI got the opportunity to infiltrate a encrypted service as it was being developed. They developed a confidential human source that was in the middle of developing this product and this technology in Nam. And this person turned themselves, turned themselves into a cooperator, uh, agreed to continue to develop the service, but give the FBI a way to access and monitor it. It was a huge operation that yielded huge rewards. But sometimes police can make lots of arrests by simply mailing a postcard. Police officers in Chandler, Arizona, des described how their scam came about. Our warrant officer realized there was a huge amount of outstanding DUI warrants. He sent all of the suspects um, letters to their last known address, informing them that they had been uh, you know, selected to receive a prize and gave them a time and location where they needed to show up. Tying the suspects into the you know, illusion that they were getting a prize. The lucky winners show up to claim their prize. Their identities were checked and they were registered. They were then escorted into another room where winners were celebrating. You've been caught up in the police sting. What? <laughs> you have a warrant for your arrest, ma'am. <laughs> you have a warrant for your arrest, ma'am. You're under Are arrest. You no, you're under arrest. Can I call you first? Thank you. Are you, this is a joke. No, it's not no. a joke. You are under arrest. What? What for? You have a warrant for your arrest. The officer or detective? I don't understand. Like, Why? Did you have a ticket that you haven't taken care of? I <laughs> think it went this. Gonna, oh my God. Right yep. It's all fun and games until someone gets arrested. The long cons we've talked about today involve people conning other people. In 2016, Wells Fargo Bank was found to have intentionally created 2 million fake accounts. Fake accounts. The bank's strategy was to increase cross sales, using one sale to promote other products. For example, introducing a new checking account customer to a bank's mortgage services. Now there's nothing new there, but bank executives pressured employees to sell more and more products and to create false. In the end, the bank ended up paying a fine of three billion dollars to settle civil and criminal charges. None of the company's top executives went to jail, but 5,300 employees lost their jobs. That's probably why Senator Elizabeth Warren took the opportunity during a banking committee hearing to open up a fresh can of whoop-ass on Wells Fargo's CEO, John Stumpf. So you haven't resigned. You haven't returned a single nickel of your personal earnings. You haven't fired a single senior executive. Instead, evidently, your definition of accountable is to push the blame to your low-level employees, low employees who don't have the money for a fancy PR firm to defend themselves. It's gutless leadership. And she's just getting warmed up. You know, here's what really gets me about this, Mr. Stump. <laughs> if one of your tellers 
took a handful of $20 bills out of the cash drawer, drawer, they'd probably be looking at criminal charges for theft. They could end up in prison. But you squeezed your employees to the breaking point so they would cheat customers and you could drive up the value of your stock and put hundreds of millions of dollars. In. It all blew up. You kept your job. You kept your multi-million dollar bonuses. And you went on television to blame thousands of $12 an hour employees who were just trying to meet cross-sell quotas that made you rich. This is about accountability. You should resign. Wells Fargo customers didn't see the scam coming. There was no way they could. It's easy to believe that there's a way to bribe someone to get your child into a better school or that there's a system to beat the stock market. What's unreasonable is to think you'll get away with it. You'll either lose your money to the con artist who spotted to the con artist who spotted you as a sucker or the undercover police officer who became your new best friend. A successful con seduces a sucker into a world dreams can come true. Power and great riches are within their grasp. Entering this world comes with an admission fee, but this opportunity is special and only special people are allowed inside. This magic casts a spell that leads its audience to hand over all their money to scammers who vanish before the sucker realizes it was all an illusion. If you enjoy the podcast, please help us out by telling your friends and, encour and encouraging them to listen. Scams and Cons is available wherever podcasts are found and at scamsandcons.com. You can also follow us on Facebook. Just search for Scams and Cons. Lastly, we'd also be grateful for five star rating wherever you're listening right star rating wherever you're listening right now. It goes a long way toward building our audience. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for listening.